The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, we're coming out of the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, barbecues, time off, sunshine, bike rides here in Durango. Fantastic bike rides here. Yeah. In Durango. How was your barbecue? Well, I'd say it was at least 10% better than last year's. Okay, now, Dave, I understand that you think in numbers a lot, but 10%. How do you know a barbecue is 10% better than last year? Well, what we call hedons, these measures of hedonic enjoyment, oh. of hedonism, if you will. And I'd have to say that the meat was better, the barbecue was hotter, and uh, even had a little smoke going on, little barbecue chips, you know, the wood chips and whatnot. Right. So I'd have to say that adjusted for inflation, we came out good on this barbecue. Kevin, if mine was 10% better, how would you measure your Memorial Day weekend? <laughs> you know, I wasn't thinking in percentages, but I just read something that the Memorial Day weekend barbecue this year cost 29% more than last year. And I have to ask myself, was this a 29% improvement in the meat that I was eating? 29% improvement in, I don't know, the, the tomatoes that were on the burger? Those are more expensive, actually, more than the 29%. This was shocking to me. My wife came home and said, you know, I had to request I had to request tomatoes on my hamburger, and I said, where were you? She was McDonald's. So McDonald's and Burger King both, now it's tomatoes on request. Right, because of the, quote, shortage. I've, I've heard of this. The low end for a box of 25 pounds of tomatoes last year was $5. More typically, 18 to $20 per box as a 25-pound box. Now it's between 48 and $75 a box. Well, no wonder McDonald's and Burger King, they don't want to put those on the burger because, frankly, they want to avoid having to raise the price of the burger, which well, is built into it. And would certainly blow up the dollar menu, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Just talking about then Gasoline. Think about gasoline last Memorial Day, Dave, versus the gasoline price this Memorial Day. I think we were paying less than three bucks a gallon last year. Well, I know I paid over three bucks for diesel, and now it's over four. So roughly a 35% jump in what I paid from last year to this. So in other words, using this hedonic message where things just get better and better with the price. So what we're saying is things were just about a third better than they were last year. I, I certainly hope the listener felt the same thing. But I guess if you factor in the hedonic adjustment, then the, the real inflation from last Memorial Day to this was probably closer to 20% Isn't that than amazing? the 29%. So. Well, what's the government telling us right now? I mean, if you look at the market, oil is over 100. Okay. Oil is over 100. Let's just look at the market real quickly, Kevin, just as, as sort of a recap coming into the, the new week. Oil's over 100, gold's over 1,500, about 1,540. Last year was about 1,200 at this time. Right. The Dow is at 12,500, and we've got NASDAQ roughly 2,800. The dollar last year this time was about 86 and change compared to the euro index, and we're about 74.5 this week. So, so a substantial drop. Almost I mean, a 14% even... decline in the currency. Well, and you didn't mention silver, okay? Silver, everyone seemed to focus on this astronomical move when it went up close to 50. But in reality, just a year ago, weren't we under 18, $20? 18 and change, and we're up from that point about 116%. So even with a tremendous drop in price off of $48, $49, we're still up 116% year on year. Gold's up 28% year on year. And this is a pretty fascinating time. Kevin, when we look at the market, this is particularly fascinating because it's beyond price. This is the personality and the people involved in the marketplace. Right. There's a new immunity. You look at the news from a decade ago, and any singular disclosure would have disturbed or destabilized the markets. And today, you've got so many things happening that it seems that everyone has just said, well, que sera, sera. Uh, whatever will be, will be. Right. The future is not ours to see. You know, th this is kind of crazy because it's, it's as if so there's so much bad news that it's now banal. No one cares. No one cares, and they've checked out. Well, there's a point, though, Dave, where, I mean, let's face it, we're all human, and we're hearing all this bad news on a daily basis. You get to hear a lot of it here on a weekly basis with the program. I mean, we're looking for good news, and it's hard to find. But there's a point where you go, okay, what do you do? You do what you can do, and then there is a point where you go and you spend 30% more for a burger and about the same amount more for gasoline if you have it. And if you don't have it, 
you know, we've got, unfortunately, the highest amount of people right now ever on food stamps. 44 million, actually over 44 million people. So coming up on 15% of the U.S. population. That's amazing. On food stamps. Now, Kevin, I think this is where people, certainly in spite of coming into sort of the summer doldrums, need to pay attention. There's a lot of things happening in June, and there's a lot of things that have just been announced which are worth looking at and being cognizant of, because it does represent sort of shifting sands under your feet. And if you're in the marketplace, these numbers really do matter. Well, I have a question for you. Are we growing or are we shrinking? I mean, you get different information on the news, and a lot of times they're talking about GDP growth, but what really is gross domestic product? running at right now. Kevin, the soundness of the logic is based on your assumptions. You can follow sort of a, a logical sequence of, of thought. Kevin, sound logic still needs to be based on sound assumptions. You can have good logic with bad assumptions and end up with the wrong side of things. Sure. You, we've watched J.P. Morgan, Goldman, a number of the Wall Street firms lower their GDP estimates for this year, and it still ignores some of the assumptions that go into that number. We had the GDP figure come out at 1.8% versus what was expected at 2.2%. Right. And of particular note is the GDP deflator. The deflator is the number that serves as the assumed rate of inflation when they're putting together their GDP figures. Well, surely they tell the truth on the deflator. Yeah, I would think that the government, they don't lie. Well, we've got the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which has said that the April figure came in at 3.2%. So even though the Memorial Day weekend was 29% more expensive, everything else that comes in 3.2%. But the Bureau of Economic Analysis, Kevin, actually uses 1.9% as their assumed inflation number. Yeah. So 3.2 isn't the number. 6.5 isn't the number if you're using an older model, which we've discussed. 10.7 is not the number. They're figuring inflation at 1.9%. And as we've said ad nauseum on our commentary, understating inflation equals overstated GDP. So in other words, even the 1.8%, David, is, is overstated using this logic. It is. It is. So if we did use the current and understated number, 3.2% inflation, that's what the BLS gave us for the April number, Kevin, instead of 1.8%, we'd be at 0.56%, just over half of 1% GDP growth. And David, that's using the 3.2% inflation number, which we know is still understated. Yeah, just bumping it marginally from the assumed 1.9% to 3.2% takes you to almost a negative GDP number. Kevin, then you throw in the inventory buildups, which ultimately lower production in the future, and you've got GDP, which would have come in at 0.6% instead of the 1.8%. So any way you look at it, the economic fundamentals driving GDP are quickly deteriorating. And we're just wondering when Wall Street will wake up to that, or if they're just comfortable with bad assumptions as they go about their fairly logical business. David, you're actually giving the benefit of the doubt, even using those numbers, because with the bailout funds, we've talked about the bailout funds adding, what is it, 8, 9, 10% to the GDP. We are actually in a very severe negative shrink rate if you take out the bailout money. Kevin, this is where our conversation with Richard Duncan this last year, I think, was very very insightful. He said, you know, GDP, whether it's up or down on a given month or a given quarter or by the end of the year, what it neglects is that we're on life support, that this government spending, deficit spending, uh, to the tune of $1.65 trillion is keeping the economy alive without it the patient dies, yeah. and we're in a 1930s-style depression. So what's the difference between the 1930s-style depression and today? The government's ability to add to its stock of IOUs. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, Kevin, in, in regards to the debt ceiling. Kevin, the Chicago Purchasing Managers Index, which is a good month-on-month -month look at, at the manufacturing trends, fell precipitously from 67 to 56. So basically what this is saying is manufacturers are less busy, even more less busy than what was expected. And truly, at 56.6, anything above 50 is still considered a positive number. What surprised everyone was that the drop from 67 to 56 was the largest one-month drop since Lehman Brothers and the fall of 2008. Well, David, that's not just in manufacturing. I mean, real estate 
has been looking for a recovery now for a year and a half. They keep talking about this period of time when maybe more houses are going to sell. But, you know, the Case-Shiller Index just came out, and it looks like the shrinkage continues. Well, we forgot to mention, Kevin, when we were looking at our sort of market review, that the 30-year mortgage is now 4.6%, which is lower by 18 basis points from last year. So you would think people would be buying houses left and right. That's really cheap money, Kevin. It's really cheap money. But you're right. The Case-Shiller Index was down 3.6%. 6%, 3.61%, and it's generally agreed, even by the National Association of Realtors, that this is confirmation of a double dip in housing. There was one city that had positive year-on-year growth numbers in terms of the prices that were garnered for a single-family home. Somebody is actually seeing an increase in real estate. Yep, because the economy is as healthy as I'll get out. One city, if you had to guess, what would it be? Well, let's see. It would have to be a city that's not dependent on manufacturing. Right. It'd have to be a city that's not really dependent on agriculture or keeping people employed. Right. You could loosely argue that it's dependent on finance, but it's more about collection of bills than it is actually creatively putting deals together. David, there was a city last year (laughs) when things were really rough in the economy, not that they're not rough now, that we walked down the street. I remember it was right after the Easter service. And we walked, we just decided to walk home. Boom time. It was a beautiful, booming city. And we were like, gosh, there's no economic depression here. And it just happened to be a city that was without a state. You know you're in trouble when D.C. is out of money and you head into a recession in that particular place. So when a politician says they feel your pain. Not really. (laughs) Not really. (laughs) It sounds like Greece, Dave. In Greece right now, there are tens of thousands are riding, and they're just completely upset at the political class. i got to be honest with you, though, Kevin. The fact that D.C. is the only city out of 20 that was not in decline I don't think that's funny. No, it's it's not funny. But, <laughs> but, you know, I have a hard time laughing, but I really don't think that's funny. Political volatility, Kevin, this is, I think, what we see in Greece. And what you're seeing is that this political volatility f- has followed on the heels of a public perception of a mismanagement of public trust. I mean, right. you're talking about assets which are being spent liberally in one part of the country. And the people are not happy with it. That's certainly the case in Athens, where on a daily basis, there's protests about austerity, and they want someone to pay in government. Sure. They feel like they've been abused, and the trust has been abused, and there's been a tremendous amount of corruption endemic to the state and their interaction with the EU. Where did all the money go, is the question. Where did all the money go? We've added all this debt, and it didn't go to anything productive. What did you guys do to us? That's a future question, Kevin, I think will be asked here stateside, as well as in other parts of Western Europe, not just your southern peripheral states. Well, and you talk about mismanagement. Okay, yes, we have political mismanagement. It's almost become cliche, Dave. You were talking about the numbness that people experience. But, you know, something that got us into this trouble that wasn't necessarily political mismanagement, but it was financial mismanagement, were these collateralized debt obligations. As we went into this real estate bust, these CDOs were packaged debts, right, that nobody really knew what it was connected to that were never going to pay. Right, packaged debts that were certified by S&P and Moody's, as AAA rated, and then sold into pension funds all over the world, sold into investment schemes all over the world and you know we say schemes these were actually schemes and they're back at it again this month June is the first month we'll see CDOs back in the marketplace since 2007 so they're back and interestingly Kevin it's commercial real estate in particular that's being creatively packaged and offloaded onto investors I wonder why I Mm. wonder why is there a second shoe to drop in the commercial space well why would you be getting rid of the paper if you didn't want to keep it? Why would it have to be creatively structured along the lines of the, the packaging that was done in 2005, 6, and 7? Well, could it possibly be some of this Arizona desert kind of real estate? <laughs> hey, we have this dream out in the middle of the Arizona desert. We're going to build this beautiful community. Not really near anything, but it's going to be amazing. Hey, Kevin, what you're talking about is the Calpers property that uh, <laughs> they bought for $400 million back okay. in 2006. Calpers is the California pension plan. Correct. They had a dream. They had an amazing dream. This stretch of desert was going to be 42,000 homes, a new model community 60 miles southwest of Phoenix. They bought the land, raw land, for $400 million, and it was hammer price last week sold for $32.5 million. Wow, that sounds like a little bit of a loss, Dave. That's about eight cents on the dollar. 
good piece of land, 10,200 acres, but eight cents on the dollar. It reminds me, Kevin, of what Warren Buffett has often said. You see who's swimming naked when the tide goes up. <laughs> or better yet, after 20 minutes at the card table, if you can't figure out who the patsy is, it's probably you. But, but in this particular case, Dave, it took California five years uh, to five figure years out, to the figure out they were the patsy. Right. Now, it's a good thing they've got billions to burn and they don't have any other fiscal issues in the state. Okay. Now, we're taking shots at real estate, but there have been homes sold. There's just been a tremendous amount of foreclosure homes sold. 28% of all homes sold in the first quarter were foreclosures. That's about six times higher than a normally functioning housing so market. The, basically, the real estate market is consistent mainly of foreclosures. A good percentage of the volume has been these foreclosed homes, which of course depresses prices of the regular homes that are sold as well. Kevin, you've got banks that are currently in possession of about 872,000 homes. That's an immense inventory, twice what it was in 2007, Kevin. So the, the mm -hmm. bank inventories have doubled since 2007. But that's not all. There's about a million additional homes coming in to the foreclosure process. So it's like that tsunami wave coming in after the earthquake. Right, right. So, so there will be added homes under the bank inventories. And Kevin, that's not all. There's a pipeline of foreclosures being fed by an additional 5 million problem and delinquent loans at present. So Kevin, I, the idea of recovery, certainly the Case Shiller Index is saying, nope, we're not going to get it and we're not going to see it for the foreseeable future. But you've got a massive, massive volume of homes behind it. And Kevin, so when you look at the rates at 4.6% on the mortgage rate, that is not indicative of a thriving market. You can't get a loan today, Kevin. You can't get a loan unless you are a pristine borrower with perfect credit. Which that affects housing starts. You know, I've got a couple of good guys working on a deck of mine right now, finishing out the, it's that new artificial decking that you put out. And these guys are very good at their jobs, but they were honest. They said, look, the last two years, we've had a really hard time getting work. And these guys are two of the best in town. Well, if you compare to peak numbers, Kevin, you're talking about housing starts and new home sales, both categories, 75% below peak numbers with existing home sales being 29% below peak numbers and again those existing home sales one-third of them fit in the foreclosure category we talked earlier kevin about food stamps and the fact that 44.199 million people are now on food stamps right kevin that's up from 26 million in 2007 the problem is not getting better the problem is not getting better. Unfortunately, the problem is getting worse. And I fear that it's the same cause here as in Greece and in many places in Europe. We're not looking at primary causes. Just a reminder, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney.com. M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Well, David, from a federal level, we've got Congress debating how much more money to spend or if they can raise the ceiling or if they're not going to raise the ceiling. They're really using it mainly as a political tool right now to get their message heard. But you've got, at the same time, states where their bills are coming due, they can't raise their debt ceiling. They well, can't print money. And I think we've addressed this before, Kevin. When you were talking about the debt ceiling and it being raised to propose $2.4 trillion more this week, Republicans will grandstand, Democrats will grouse about what needs to be done, an increase in taxes is preferred over a decrease in spending. You know, Kevin, all of this is really a political charade. And, and coming back to that one word used earlier to describe CalPERS, right. Patsy, Right. The general public is the patsy if they think that this debt ceiling debate is at all relevant. Kevin, $20.7 trillion is the real-world number, factoring in Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and your off-balance sheet liabilities. So the debt ceiling, it's a little bit of a, a non-issue, in right. my opinion. But when you do come to the state level, you're dealing with a real issue, a real issue that 2012 is front and center. Now, 2012 is closer than you think because for most municipals, their fiscal year begins in July. So we are coming into fiscal year 2012 for most municipalities just here in the next 30 to 45 days. So are you saying that bailout money was used before to pay state debt, and at this point, that's not there? Well, essentially, Kevin, you had state tax revenue, which... For 2012, you've got a federal subsidy which is going away. If you recall, last year we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which pumped in $137 billion into state budgets. 
we had a budget gap of 191 billion. So 191 missing, 137 to fill the gap, and there was help. only a partial underfunded portion. So the problem is we don't have the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in play for 2012, but we do have a 112 billion dollar budget shortfall for fiscal 2012. You and know, again, that begins July 1st. You know, Dave, it's in life, delaying a problem versus just addressing the problem seems to be the real issue. I mean, look at Greece. Didn't the CIA actually say that a military coup is possible in Greece at this point? That's the rumor. The rumor is that there's a CIA report indicating that things get much worse in terms of social unrest, that a military coup will be in play to bring about greater stability. And that's a factor that was caused by the same things we're talking about here stateside. Now we're looking at it in Europe. It's just they're a little bit ahead of the game. We're starting to see the financial go to the economic, go to the political, go to the strategic or the military side of things fairly quickly. And the military side of things could actually come from within, couldn't it? Yeah, and politicians are not wanting to look at how severe this is. Merkel's finally agreed to a further bailout within Greece, which, you know, if you look at what that did to compromise her place in the German state in the last 12 to 18 months, she may have just ended her political career career. Saving the German banks is, is obviously a priority and not wanting them to take a haircut where she's putting basically Germany and the rest of the EU. Kevin, in an attempt to save the German banks, she's allowing the German public and the European public to essentially pay the price rather than restructuring the assets that are sitting on their bank balance sheets. Well, David, you brought out last week and you've brought out in weeks prior to that that the real event is the thing that they're not talking about. They're trying to keep this huge huge event from occurring that has to do with credit default swaps. And right. If Merkel doesn't step in and do something... Then you have a credit event, which triggers credit default swap payment and a whole slew of counterparty problems. And that's could level things. Oh, right, and we talked about that a few weeks ago. I mean, you've got other folks, Kevin, there's now growing conflict within Germany. You've got Merkel who's agreeing to a further bailout. Then you've got ministers of parliament who are suggesting that Greece just leave the EU. There's going to be greater and greater conflict between different political factions, whether it is in Germany, whether it's in Spain, whether it's in Portugal, and this is where we see a tremendous amount of volatility politically in the whole equation. It's like having a guy at the party that you just step up to and you say, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just leave at this point? <laughs> you know, Berlusconi, I mean, Italy's not immune from this either. Berlusconi had tapped one particular mayoral candidate, and he lost the election. Hmm. Berlusconi's reputation was on the line. This is seen as a watershed event in Italy where he is losing credibility the same way Merkel has in the different state elections starting about six months ago and coming forward to the present. Well, and lastly, Kevin, you've got the Spanish protests, which have turned violent over the weekend. It, this is not a problem that has been so. Solved, and it's not a problem that is easy to solve when you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Well, and aren't we at about 40% unemployment for people under the age of 30 in Spain right now? So there's plenty of time for these protests. That's correct. You have, this is kind of coming from an interesting quarter, Kevin, but the former central bank governor in Argentina, who was on the scene during the 2002 default and devaluation, Mario Blagier, he, he does bring an interesting insight into the European debt wranglings. His appraisal of the IMF, the ECB, and the EU understanding of the crisis is that they're coming at it from the wrong perspective to begin with. They're viewing it as a liquidity event. If they add new debts to old, that'll sort itself out. All they need to do is buy time. Mario's saying, no, no, this is a structural problem. There's too much debt, folks. There's too much debt, and there's it's, no way to pay it off. It's a little like putting a Band-Aid on a heart attack, okay? It's just it's the wrong thing for the wrong problem. But... It's a structural problem, Dave, isn't it? I mean, you've got to get to the very core of the structure. You can't just keep throwing money at it. Right. But Brussels and Frankfurt had assumed that the Greece bailout last year, 12 months ago, would be sufficient to get them on their feet, and they'd be able to borrow from the capital markets and start getting some, some IOUs back in play. That hasn't happened, Kevin. That hasn't happened at all. And this is what Mario calls a European Ponzi scheme. So is Blagier basically saying that they need to do what they did down in South America? Just yeah. Default. That's exactly his conclusion. Default is a requirement, in his opinion, to return to any sort of economic normalcy. He says, I quote, the real question isn't whether, but when and how. And Kevin, I think this is an interesting thing. I mean, there's not an exact parallel between a state like Greece and Argentina going back to 2001, 2002. Because in the case of Argentina, they both defaulted on debt and devalued their currency. Because the they had time. that sovereign power to do that. 
And you don't have that in the peripheral states. You don't have that in any of the European states. They cannot devalue. They, they can default. They can choose to default. So that is a difference between the European peripheral countries and Argentina. But he suggests that rather than pretending that this is a liquidity event and spending money to little or no effect, default. Start over. And if you're going to spend money, rather than do it perpetuating something that's not going to be workable in the long run anyways, take the money that you would have spent in the bailout, give it to the banks. Yeah. You know that the banks are going to take a significant haircut in the case of default. You know you're going to destabilize the banking system. So go ahead and create a backstop for the banks and financial institutions. I'm not saying this is my suggestion, but certainly the former central bank governor Argentina. Again, this comes from an interesting perspective. You know, hey, we don't have the money. Right. Default. Hey, we have the money. Print. I mean, this is almost serial in South America. But he's saying something very clearly here, Kevin, which I think is, is spot on. And that is the EU, ECB, and IMF are viewing this as a temporary problem. And it's anything but temporary. It's structural in nature. Well, and David, on a lot of the things that you talk about on a weekly basis and the guests that we interview, we don't necessarily agree with the solution when they come up with some of these things. Yeah, just default, pay the banks off. But what it does is it brings an insight into the problem itself because that actually, as foolish as that sounds, just go ahead and default, go ahead and pay the banks what they would have lost, that sounds ludicrous. But actually, it's smarter than probably what's going on right now, which is just printing money and throwing it at a problem that gets bigger and bigger every year. Kevin, there's a couple of EU officials who have argued strongly that they can't allow default to occur because it would just be an utter disaster, and these peripheral countries would never be able to borrow again. They would be ostracized forever. It's, it's the scarlet letter. You can't default. Right. Mexican debt defaults and other Latin American debt defaults over the last 20 to 30 years corrected the conventional wisdom, which was, in fact, you'd be locked out of the capital markets. That is not the case. The countries that defaulted quickly in Latin America, after about six months, had access to the capital markets because the capital market, this is the financial markets, whether it's London, New York, they have a memory, which is about two nanoseconds. Oh, we lost money on you? Oh, but we could garner new fees from doing new business with you? What happened yesterday is irrelevant. What can we do today? What's the deal of the hour? So it's like when the mad parent says, you are grounded for a year. And then within about 20 minutes, they're back on track doing what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, David, okay, conventional wisdom would be that when this debt comes due, it's going to have to be paid. Are there unconventional ways that they can deal with this? This is pretty unique, Kevin, because I think, you know, in the attempt to avoid default, in the attempt to avoid a dislocation in the debt markets by having some sort of a credit event, what's being suggested currently with Greek debt is that to relieve rollover pressure, these debts that are coming due, instead of having to pay cash, pay the principal back on the loan, right. they're talking about there being no defaults but no redemptions either. So in other words, I can't get my money out of my bond? Well, the bond will mature just as you expect it to. There will be a pay date, but rather than being paid in cash, they will issue you a new bond instead of cash. And this is one of the proposed solutions that captures the current audience of bondholders and keeps them captured, if you will, as an audience for these bonds. Well, this sounds like something that's happened just every once in a while during time of war, you know, war bonds, things like that, where you have, it just goes on and on without a maturity. Kevin, in, in essence, they're extending the maturities. In essence, they're extending the maturities, but they're doing that, allowing the existing debts to mature first, and then issuing new bonds in their place to avoid that credit event, to avoid the default or credit default swap trigger. And you think that will avoid the triggering of this huge event if they just extend the maturities? But they're not extending the maturities. That's the nuance is it allows one bond to mature. Right. End of contract, beginning of new contract. And they're giving you a new contract and a new maturity date. You may not have been complicit. You may not have been interested in receiving a new IOU instead of cash, but that's what you get. I guess that's why we used to call them perpetuals. Exactly. Kevin, the last issue on the Greek debt is, is that when you look at the 10-year paper, as we mentioned, it's 13 percentage points above German paper. We talked about that in recent weeks. But if you look at two-year Greek paper, it's fetching 26 percent. These are the kinds of numbers that you see immediately before default. If you're buying two-year Greek paper, it's paying you 26 percent. Now, for anyone who's income hungry and you say, wow, that's attractive, yeah. just be aware you're getting ready to have your head handed to you. Default is imminent. Granted, Kevin, somebody who's value hungry is going to say, no, 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 the EU won't allow it to happen. This represents the greatest bargain since, since the beginning of time. 
Maybe. Maybe. But you have to realize there's a risk that comes with that reward. Kevin, I I think one of the things we have to look at here in June, this is our advice. Do not go on vacation this month and leave your investments on autopilot. Do not go on vacation this month and leave your investments on autopilot. So what you're saying is watch and be wary. Why is that? Well, you've got the issues relating to Europe and the issues relating to U.S. credit all clustered in the month of June. As Junker, the EU official, has said, details of a further bailout for Greece will be determined by the end of the month. I'm quoting Bloomberg here. We will try to solve the Greek problem by the end of June. Okay. What's interesting, Kevin, is that nothing definite was agreed upon this last weekend. Right. They tried to figure out how to solve the Greek issue and couldn't get it done. So they basically said, well, we'll get it done by the end of June. But that money comes due, does it not, in this next month? You've got a whole bunch of things coming due. You've got the Greek IMF tranche, which is due for repayment June 29th. That's the date, the 29th, when Greece is officially out of money. Minor detail. Note to self, try to find some more money by the end of June. QE2 here in the United States right. ends June 30th. And on that same day, they're talking about putting the new IMF chief, who's to be chosen between now and then, in office. So when it rains, it pours, but you don't want to be on vacation and you don't want to be not paying attention. Kevin, this comes back to the main issue. Not enough has been done over the last 12, 18, 24 months to look at the real structural issues, Kevin. Insufficient adjustments have been made, and now we have default and restructurings which have to occur at some point in Europe. The question is, will they happen in the United States as well? Kevin, I think the summer is going to be anything but dull. If we're used to the summer doldrums, I would not expect it this year. Mm. Everyone from Mark Mobius, who, who's the executive chairman of Templeton Asset Management, to a number of different asset managers, Kevin, in the hedge fund space, look at what we've done to ignore the structural changes which needed to occur here in the United States. And just as a reminder, here come the CDOs, right. month of June. Have we changed anything? Have we changed anything in terms of the real regulation of the derivative space? No. We're in a position now, Kevin, to do a repeat as we head into the fall of 2008. You know, and this is something probably to consider even for people who are very experienced in the financial and economic markets, because we've all been set to a pattern. I know after decades of watching these markets, both of us, in the summer usually watch the Europeans go on six-week holiday. There's a lot of things that are built into the system to sort of relax the system during the summer months. And then, of course, you've pointed out in the past that the fall comes, and it usually gets to be pretty, it can be tumultuous. But in this particular case, I don't know that the Europeans have that six-week luxury that they've had in the past. And same thing here in America. It may be a long, hot summer, but not because of relaxation. No, I think June to October 2011 will be a time frame to remember. It might, in fact, be seared into an investor's memory. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Or call us at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.